split that 50-50. Federal agents say another common scheme was on supplies like lumber, local officials regularly receiving a 10% payoff. In many cases, the 10% bribe was paid on petroleum products overpriced by as much as 500%. Government sources say agents and grand juries are looking at county supply records in Alabama, Arkansas, Mississippi, Tennessee, Oklahoma, and Texas, where officials may have siphoned off millions of tax dollars. We found that, that the bribing of county officials and also school officials in some instances was pervasive. It was more or less a way of life. The federal crackdown on local corruption has grand juries meeting here in Tyler, Texas, and in a dozen other southern cities. Officials say indictments could come down for as many as 50 Texas county officials, as many as 100 in Oklahoma. Sandy Gilmore, NBC News, Tyler, Texas. The other day, Mary sent uh, Willard out to get one of those home computers, and he came back with a pet computer. And they've got a computer yeah. show. Funny you should mention that, oh. Jane. In Dallas, Texas this weekend, I want you to meet Tom Brokaw's agent. There he is, going to see Tom right there. He's on his way now to Cape uh, Canaveral, getting 20% of Tom's hard-earned money. Go get him, Tiger. Cut. That's enough. He ain't union. We can't use him more than one shot. Anyway, the computer show's in Dallas. Check it out. It's supposed to be spectacular. They have real robots down there. A Sears robot. We have the 30s in the northern Rockies where they're calling for some snow today, heavy mountain snows, and uh, we are calling for that today. And I think we need a light over there. Look at that. I feel like Moses, just say the word. Heavy mountain snows in the Rockies, rain in the northwest, California, great, but we do have some fog along the coast. Texas is going to be hot again today, some puffy clouds, but look at this mild, beautiful high pressure and throughout the northern plains, central and southern plains, clearing around the Great Lakes. Watch out for thunder showers and storms today. Southern Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, on up to the Tennessee Valley. Thunder showers in the mid-Atlantic up to New England with rain. South is looking fabulous, and southern Florida couldn't be better. <clears throat> Excuse me, better. Now let's check some temperatures around the nation this morning. Here's weather for the tri-state area. Cloudy with showers today, high 65. Clearing tonight, low 53. Beautiful tomorrow, 68. Winds south, 10 to 20 today. The fabulous Tucson Boys Choir will be in Washington, D.C. this weekend. They are spectacular. 41 years they've been singing. Now here's Jane. And we're going back to Cape Canaveral. Canaveral. Tom is there in a moment, but first, this is today on NBC. Sunrises in Florida, Sunrise Lakes in Fort Lauderdale, and Sunrise of Palm Beach. 810, I want you to meet my two helpful experts who are here with me from NASA this morning. This is Joe Kerwin, one of the astronauts. He's an MD, a Navy flight surgeon. He was up in Skylab 2 in 1973. And Judy Resnick is among the first women astronauts chosen in 1978 after getting her doctorate in electrical engineering. We're going to talk more with her later in this hour about being a woman and being an astronaut. Now, with their help, we're going to show you what we can expect to see tomorrow if everything works out well. We're going to take a look at some animation, some film provided by NASA of what they expect will happen when the Columbia lifts off tomorrow morning at 6.50. This is what it should look like as it takes off, and it will go into a really convulsive maneuver right off the pad, won't it, Joe? Well, I wouldn't call it convulsive, although there's a lot of vibration the instant those uh, solids come on. The crew gets shaken around in their seats pretty well for about four seconds. They immediately start a roll program to point them uprange toward the north, and then the thing begins to pitch over. Two minutes into the flight, the solid rockets are already spent. They're separated. It burns another six and a half minutes, approximately, uh, with the main engines on the shuttle. The external tank is then empty of fuel. You're not in orbit yet when the tank is uh, separated because it comes down in the ocean. So the orbiter immediately lights its own maneuvering engines, which just went off, and gives it that final uh, few hundred feet per second boost that'll get it into an orbit. Uh, there's a second burn later to circular, uh, circularize the orbit, and about six hours after that, two more burns to raise the orbit. Now we go right to the reentry. After the reentry burn to slow the vehicle down, it turns way nose up, lets the bottom of it absorb the heat, and then at the, at the end, you pitch the nose down. We're looking at live film from the approach and landing test program into the lake bed runway at Edwards Air Force Base, uh, much okay. like an aircraft, but there are no engines. This, uh, this vehicle is gliding home. You drop the wheels at the very last minute, 30 seconds before touchdown, uh, in order to save the drag. You touch down uh, on the lake bed at about uh, 200 miles an hour, 180 knots, uh, and roll out some 10,000 feet before coming to a stop. 
And Judy, with, this is a critical part. It was, people would find this hard to believe, but we're going to show you a critical part of the Columbia. These are the tiles that are on the bottom of it here as it re-enters when it's going to hit, what, temperatures of 2,500 degrees or so? Uh, yes, the temperatures can get that hot on the bottom and on the leading uh, surfaces of the wings. And there's uh, 30,000 tiles on the orbiter of different construction. They're sort of like a styrofoam. They can, they can absorb 3,000 degrees of heat on one side, and yet you can pick them up on the, in the other side with your bare hand so it protects the aluminum skin of the orbiter, prevents it from overheating and the, the re-entry. All right, we have uh, Roy Neal down in Houston this morning as well, and he's going to describe for us what they expect to be doing while they're up there in orbit. They hope that they'll be up there for 54 and a half hours altogether, about 36 orbits. Roy? Okay, Tom and Joe and Judy. At the moment, I'm standing in the aft section of the flight deck of our NBC space shuttle simulator. As a matter of fact, uh, using this model to give you some idea, here's where we are right now. See those two little windows? Okay, right behind me, you'll see two little windows. And they overlook the payload they are, call it the cargo hold, if you will. I guess if there's anything that's really important about this flight, the experiment is the spacecraft itself. And these payload bays are a big part of that because inside they have reflectors, which are radiators. And that's how they air condition the spacecraft. And the astronauts will be at this position during that time when they are controlling the cargo bay. Uh, they have television monitors, color and black and white, which we hope to share here on Earth. And uh, Tom, I guess that's about it. Okay, right. We're going to talk. Uh, Judy, there's an awful lot of talk about aborts. I mean, when we went down to Houston to talk with the astronauts, everybody said, well, it may not go the full mission, 54 and a half hours. What is the expectation in NASA? That they'll be able to get it all the way around and get it back to Edwards Air Force Base, or do you think that they'll have to cut it short at some point? Well, I think the, the, the hopes of everybody is that it will, it will last the 54 uh, hours. Uh, one of the things about the way NASA does business is that we pre prepare for every possible contingency, and that includes uh, p potential abort modes. There are several abort modes. One is if you have a, a problem with your engines, uh, you come back and land here at the Cape, uh, make, just go downrange, make a U-turn, and come back and land here. Uh, there's another abort mode where you can go once around and come back and land in at Edwards, and then you can also abort to an orbit that is lower than the planned orbit. Uh, there's a lot of practice with crew and the ground controllers on what to do in case you need to orbit, but uh, to, to abort. But uh, I think the expectation is that we're trained to do whatever we can to handle an, an, an emergency situation where you have to come back. But the big hope is just to get it back so they can use it again, right? Well, the big hope is to get it back so that we go through a re-entry and we learn how this vehicle flies. This okay. is the first test flight of a new airplane. All right. Joe Kerwin and Judy Resnick will be seeing a lot more of you in the next couple of days. We'll be back with Phil Donahue in just a few moments. This is Today on NBC. of simulated adventure. But if all goes well for astronauts Young and Crippen, more than 50 hours in orbit, history-making hours that could open the door for a new era when working and living in space will become routine. Steve, thank you. And Steve's live in Washington right now and joining us from uh, Cape Kennedy down in, uh, in Florida, former astronaut, now U.S. Senator Harrison Schmidt. Senator, what was it like for you to watch that just now, uh, and, and how much like the real thing is it? Well, they're a lot more sophisticated now, David, than uh, we were even with Apollo. Uh, the, uh, watching that simulation uh, shows that they have, they're going to have most of the sensations uh, experienced before they launch. We never experienced, for example, the vibration of launch until we actually launched, and that made you wonder why you'd gone through all the simulations for launch aborts, because it was very difficult to see the instrument panel. How good a training tool is it, Senator? It's uh, fantastic. It, it, when, you're, when your first uh, mission is the real thing, you've got to do this kind of thing to, to weed out all of the extraneous uh, experiences so you can concentrate on those things that are new. So you've talked to Young and Crippen, and they're not going to make, make a, a, a place for you tomorrow, right? No, well, not yet. I've got one. But I've still got 24 hours to work on them. So I'll be <laughs> <laughs> Senator, thank you. Steve, was it as much fun as it looked? Absolutely, David. It was uh, a terrific ride and a great experience. And uh, as the senator said, it's uh, very realistic. Does it beat scuba diving? Well, let's say I wouldn't turn down a ride on the space shuttle if it were offered. <laughs> <laughs> senator Schmidt, thanks so much for joining us today. We'll see you tomorrow. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. 17 after, we'll be back with Dr. Tim Johnson after these words.
Good morning, everyone. 8.30 on this Thursday, April the 9th, reporting to you live from the Kennedy Space Center, Cape Canaveral, Florida. There on the launching pad, the Columbia Orbiter of the Space Shuttle Program, due to be launched at 6.50 tomorrow morning, and things are going well here. Weather looks good. They're in T-minus 12 and holding now because they've caught up with most of their work. The countdown will resume this afternoon at about 4.20, we're told, Eastern Time. I'm Tom Brokaw here reporting to you live from the Kennedy Space Center. Let me say good morning to my friends back in New York, Jane and Jean Willard. How are you? Good morning, Tom. Another business coming up in this half hour, Rona Barrett will be here. Uh, they like the Carol Burnett uh, happy ending so much. Another celebrity has filed a libel suit. Rona will have details. Nancy Foreman is going to be here with the scrapbook of the future, a videograph. And let's get back to, to Tom for more business in Cape Canaveral. Well, as I, uh, as I was just saying, things are going extremely well here. And as you might expect, Jane, this is not only a big piece of space technology that we're about to witness, but you're also seeing a big part of the American sociology, uh, sociological scene here. The American pop culture in the form of souvenirs of almost any kind that you can describe. Ike Siemens has done a report for us now on the resurgence of Cape Kennedy. This is the first manned space shot in six years. Here's Ike. There haven't been crowds like this at the Kennedy Space Center since the Apollo moonshots ended in 1975. For days at the center's gift shop, people have bought thousands of dollars worth of space shuttle souvenirs. Everything from toy models to make-believe spacesuits to baseball caps, the most popular item for sale. Some Space Center employees have cashed in on the Bonanza too. One group has set up shop in a truck just outside the gate. It's selling T-shirts to commemorate Friday's launch of Columbia, the 75-ton spacecraft, which is about the size of a DC-9. There's an excitement here that has been missing for a long time. In the early days of American space travel, there was a non-stop party, and people profited from it. 72-year-old Helen Kendall's Moon Hut restaurant was popular. The big seller was the Moon Burger, complete with an olive on a toothpick to represent a satellite. She hit on hard times, but now Helen is making a comeback, thanks to the space shuttle. I'm going to have a shuttle switch sandwich. It's going to be a steak sandwich with onion rings and all the trimmings. Helen launched the shuttle switch yesterday. The final countdown is underway to determine if customers will go into orbit over it. Ike Siemens, NBC News, Cape Canaveral, Florida. And for most of the NBC crews, at least, this is the uniform of the day down here at uh, Kennedy Space Center. We look like we're members of some kind of a SWAT team from the National Broadcasting Company and from NASA. Now let's go back to New York. I think that one was my size, Tom. We've got one for you, Jane. Good. It'll be arriving. Good. <laughs> let's get to the news of the morning. The Secret Service reports that... And 15 minutes later, it landed 302 miles out into the Atlantic. Today, Shepard's landed himself a job as president of the Windward Coors Company. He's been retired from NASA since 1974. In 1962, after being postponed no less than 10 times, the Mercury 6 flight finally blasted off. John Glenn, at 40, became the first American to orbit the Earth. Glenn became a U.S. Senator from Ohio in 1974, but he hasn't abandoned space altogether. To commute from Washington to Ohio, he flies his very own two-engine Beechcraft Baron plane. Gordon Cooper piloted the last voyage of the Mercury series. That was in 1963. Two years later, he was aboard the two-man Gemini 5 mission. Cooper's got a new mission these days, his own consulting firm concentrating on alternate fuels for the auto and aviation industries. He told us that he believes by using alternate fuels, such as alcohol, we can turn this country around in about two years. And who could forget this sight? It was July 20th, 1969, when Neil Armstrong and Edwin Aldrin Jr. touched down on the rocky plain called the Sea of Tranquility. And Armstrong stepped out of the Apollo 11 to become the first man to set foot on the moon. Today, instead of going out of this world, Armstrong's going deeper into it. He's chairman of the board of Cardwell International Limited, which manufactures and sells oil well drilling equipment. And then there's Richard Gordon. He was aboard the second manned moon landing project, Apollo 12, in 1969. Three years earlier, he went along with the Gemini 11. Now he's also involved with oil. He's a consultant for the oil and gas industry in Houston. 
Interestingly enough, between his space and consulting careers, Gordon spent some time as executive vice president for the New Orleans Saints football team. Finally, there's John Young, the pilot for Gemini 3 in 1965 and the commander of Gemini 10 in 1966. Gemini 10 was the first successful rendezvous and docking mission done in space, a technique that had to be mastered before man could go to the moon. After two more Apollo missions, Young is now the commander of the Columbia Space Shuttle, America's newest spaceship ready for its first trip into orbit. And we will all be watching to see something that was only a dream when Shepard took off in that first flight back in 1961. And we'll be right back. Videotape of some of the physical training that you have to undergo at NASA. You can talk about that a little bit as we take a look at it now with Judy Resnick. It's a, it's a pretty tough program. Were you prepared for this, for the physical difficulty of it? Well, it's not really so difficult physically. Uh, it's a lot of new things, but they lead you through it by the hand. This is uh, a, a demonstration of... Uh, now, wait a minute. Greg. That doesn't look like a lot of fun for a Saturday <laughs> afternoon to me. I don't know about you. But <laughs> well, you have to learn how to survive uh, in case you have to get out of a, an airplane in a parachute, and they teach you step by step how to fall, how to be dragged. Uh, that's the impact you feel if you go through an ejection seat. And it's really not as bad as it looks. Uh, they, they show you how to fall into the water by, instead of letting you fall the first time, they let you slide down a slide wire. Like I say, they, they break you into it gradually. Were you a tomboy when you were a kid? No. You weren't, and you, and you took to this right away. You like it. It's, it's fun. What's the best part about being an astronaut? Uh, everything. You just like it all? Yes. You get to exercise your training, electrical engineering, and expand your knowledge enormously, I would think. Yes, I think the best part uh, technically is that it's a very well-rounded approach to uh, science and technology, and we get to do a little bit of everything and state-of-the-art, and it's always a challenge. What happens when you meet a man who's not in the space program and doesn't know who you are, and you say, I'm an astronaut? Does he say, yeah, you're too cute to be an astronaut. Come on, little lady, you can't be an astronaut. I just tell him I'm an engineer. <laughs> You don't tell me you're an astronaut? Not unless he asks. You really, you mean when you, when you meet people for the first time? What about the whole business about social relationships? Does it make it, are some men threatened by the fact that you're an astronaut? Uh, I don't know. If they are, they're probably not my friends. Yeah. But all the people that I know, it doesn't bother them. And, and uh, you're a professional person, whatever you do, whether you're an astronaut or a doctor or, a, or anything. Are there discussions in Houston about what happens when men and women go into space for the first time together? The dis there's not discussions among us. Yeah, there, are, there aren't any discussions or preparation for the social impact of that. And, well, you know, we're going to be talking about it after all, if you're up there in some kind of a prolonged space mission. And there may be even relationships that will develop between men and women. Well, I think from our point of view, uh, since we're so used to working together professionally that we look at each other as professional colleagues on the ground and in orbit and whatever, and, and we view it that way, period. Do you think the time will come when there will be romance in the outer space, though? Oh, gee, I really couldn't tell you that. <laughs> but people have just right for right now just a wholly professional attitude about it, and NASA has not begun to form any kind of a seminar or any kind of a training program for people to deal with that publicly or otherwise. Oh, I don't, not at all. Uh, it's a career to us, and we, we treat it that way, and so does NASA. Okay. When do you expect to go up in the shuttle? Oh, it's going to be a few years for, for us who, who are relatively new, but it's worth the wait. You'll be patient enough. I'll try. Okay, great. Judy Resnick, nice to have you with us this morning. We'll see you tomorrow morning back here as you help NBC News with its coverage of the launching of the Columbia Orbiter. We'll be back right after this word. The launch, if all goes well, and we have no reason to believe it won't, of the Space Shuttle Columbia, will be on the air at uh, 6 a.m. Eastern Time for an extended Today program. I guess by the time the Today program regular edition goes on the, on the air, uh, the Columbia ought to be on its way. Tom Brokaw will be anchoring NBC's coverage uh, throughout the Today program in the morning, and he and John Chancellor will be sharing duties. Tom has been um, reading up a lot about the space shuttle. Uh, he knows all the acronyms, what they stand for, and probably a little bit of physics to be thrown in. We've got a picture here of uh, of the uh, Houston uh, control room. And while there isn't a good deal of activity to be seen now, I assume it's going to be very, very busy this time tomorrow morning. Uh, there's no reason for them to be there now. It's a trifle busier even as we look at it than our own control room in the other room. But then that's a story for another day, isn't it? <laughs>
any event, uh, gentlemen, uh, will you all be here, or I'm on my own tomorrow, aren't I? You're on your own, but we're all going to be watching, watch Tom and watch the blast off. I mean, the 6 o'clock Today Show, that may be a tickle of the future, you know. Don't a lot of people watch. They'll say, hey, the that's a good idea for every day. Of a new era the in dawn space, of a new so era in the Today program. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 6.50, I believe, is the launch time, right? 6.50 in the morning. Yes, indeed. Supposed to be about 80 degrees and uh, should be mostly sunny when very light winds. So. Well, sometimes, even if it's a little cloudy, they look for that window. And I can remember being small and trying to envision panes of glass through which they were going to shoot uh, this or that rocket. But uh, they say the weather looks good for, for uh, 6.50 in the morning. So far, so. so Get up a little early, set your alarm clock, and be with us before you go to work tomorrow. You can go to work with the knowledge that uh, the Columbia is is up and away. I've never been present at a launch, but Willard has been. Yeah. It, it's, uh, never it's, forget it. It's a mammoth sight, huh? It is a most impressive sight. Does it sight. sound and feel? Does it, does it, does it rumble and, and shake the earth? The earth shakes and the fire comes out of the bottom of the rocket, and you see it lift off, and it's a dramatic moment. I wept. I really did. Right. Apollo 11, beautiful sight. Well, that was the one that went to the moon. That's the one that went to the moon. Yeah. Well, well it does look a little, a little Rube Goldberg down there. Yeah. Um, but that's the idea, to have a space shuttle that uh, you, you don't need to, to destroy all the rockets to, to get it up, and we hope to have the space shuttle come reusable. back. Reusable. It's uh, economic. It'll come back and take off again. Just like Tom. And he'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> and he's reusable. <laughs> well, Tom's the pro on that subject, and he'll Indeed be with he us is. bright and early in the morning. We'll see you then. Thursday, only a secret from Buck Rogers' past can save him from execution. NASA anticipated problems to crop up in this countdown on the road to launching the space shuttle Columbia here at the Kennedy Space Center, and it's having its share. Witness the latest snag. NASA was forced to do a double take, cleaning out the spacecraft's three fuel cells, and the result was another four hours of unexpected work. That was added to a scheduled hold of eight hours, meaning the countdown was stopped for 12 hours at one point without any apparent impact on Friday morning's launch. The fuel cells are important because they provide electricity and water for the astronauts during the mission. When not in use, the fuel cells are normally filled with helium and nitrogen. The inert gases keep the cells free of impurities, but have to be removed or purged when the regular reactants of hydrogen and oxygen are loaded. Well, technicians didn't get all of the helium and nitrogen out. Well, it's very much like rinsing your clothes of extra soap. Uh, we had the soap, if you will, in the system uh, in the form of nitrogen and helium in the fuel cell system. And what we had to do is run the real chemical gases through it to get all that other stuff out. Uh, the first rinsing operation wasn't sufficient, so we ran a second one. The second one was very good. We're now ready to proceed. Two valve problems have also been corrected, including one on a main engine. The difficulty was traced to some electrical wiring that had been stripped of its insulation. The valve helps the engine generate thrust at a consistent rate instead of oscillating. The question is, if more little things keep popping up, will there be enough excess time in the countdown to make it through T-minus zero, still scheduled for 6.50 Friday morning? Rob Zaya reporting from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Doctors in Washington say President Reagan... Working round the clock and still aiming towards a Friday launch, the crews picked up time by making some minor repairs faster than anticipated. Weather conditions, meantime, are said to be improving and are expected to be acceptable at launch time. As the countdown clock moved closer to launch, the Columbia's crew flew in from Houston. Astronauts John Young, a veteran with 533 hours in space, and Robert Crippen arrived at Patrick Air Force Base, where they said they're ready and raring to go. We're really looking forward to the flight, and we hope that everything will allow us to go on Friday. To avoid the possibility of infection, the astronauts will be kept in semi-isolation until launch. NASA officials say that while conditions are looking good here, they're concerned about weather conditions at the emergency landing sites in Spain, Hawaii, and New Mexico. The chances of all conditions being right at launch time, we're told, are one in eight. At the moment, said one NASA official, all we can do is keep our fingers crossed. At the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, this is Marvin Scott, Independent Network News going up in the morning. The baseball season in full swing now. And to help mark that occasion, we'll talk with Joe Garagiola of NBC Sports. 
and Yankee, former Yankee pitcher Jim Bowden, who has written the best-selling book, Ball Four. He has a sequel out now, and we'll talk with him about what's happened since he left the Major League. Since Dr. Frank is not here, Cliff Morrison will preview the weekend weather for us. We will meet former penthouse pet Cheryl Rickson, and we'll explain why penthouse publisher Bob Guccione refused late this afternoon to appear with her. Pianist Barbara Carroll will take her chances with this famous Live at Five untuned piano. We've promised Chauncey, we have really promised him we'll have time for his report on that New Jersey high school which has its own version of Live at Five. And Liz Smith has a reminder of an earthquake prediction for tomorrow. Or maybe even today. Tonight's top story, all systems are go for the launch of America's first space shuttle to Columbia less than 14 hours from now. One official said the forecast is 100% good. Frank Field is at the launch site at Cape Canaveral, and he has a live report for us in the final hours of the countdown. Frank, that's quite a sight. Well, Jack, I wish you and Sue were here. That is the Columbia Space Shuttle. It sits on its launch pad, 39A. All systems, as you said, are go. Overhead, skies are generally clear. We expect uh, nothing worse than this. In fact, the weather should be improving. Some high, thin cirrus overhead. And that shuttle took a long time getting to where it is. In fact, the transporter which brought it there takes about a mile a minute. That went back to the vehicle assembly building, which is right behind me, that huge building that's about the third largest building in the world. Now, here is some of the excitement and some of the enthusiasm as we get closer to that launch site. Launch fever is beginning to build at the Kennedy Space Center. One can almost sense it. At gate two, the influx of journalists has started. 3,000 reporters expected by Friday morning's launch. You can sort of get caught up in it. It's, it's, it's amazing. There's a fever that goes here with the space shot. This is the first time I've been here, Frank, at Cape Canaveral. In person, I've always seen it in that little tiny box. And it's a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be. The hostages and politics for literally a year and a half, almost two years, that was the story that dominated our lives. And uh, it is a very pleasant and really refreshing change to be, to be involved in something like this. There are some moments of peace, some moments of rest, but there is also space fever, and sometimes mistakes are made. We've had quite a bit of excitement out here for NBC, but not as much as they've had over at ABC when they built their building backwards. And they had to physically bring out a crane, lift the building up, and turn it 180 degrees. And CBS, to remind them which way that the launch is going to take off, they've had a little sign built on the side, which I think you should take a look at. Jack, it's not too late. You can still come down. But at any rate, we do have some interesting guests who will join us during the next hour live at 5, and uh, we'll be back. All right. Uh, we heard some sort of a rumor that the Blue Angels were down there practicing. Frank, do you know anything about that? Yeah, they're supposed to be coming overhead any minute now. And if you want to come back to us, they're supposed to come right between the launch pad, which is about three miles off in the distance, and right behind us is the vehicle assembly building. I hear some aircraft now. I don't know if that's... No, that would be, that's a helicopter coming in to pick up some film. But they should be coming through, and uh, maybe you'll come back and join us when they do. Oh, we'll try, Frank. Okay. <laughs> Meantime, astronauts John Young and Bob Crippen have set their alarm clocks for 2 a.m., which gives them just under five hours to do all the last-minute things that must be done before they rocket into space. Young is the captain, a veteran astronaut who has been to the moon. Crippen is the rookie making his first journey into space. This morning on the Today Show, both men talked with Tom Brokaw. I'm a little nervous about it publicly, yeah, I, I don't mind saying that. Uh, if you uh, climb on top of a rocket uh, space plane like this one, a space, space uh, ship that's as big as this one, that's uh, loaded with liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, and has two large solid rocket motors alongside of it, and you aren't just a little apprehensive, uh, you don't understand the problem, and uh, you know, that's normal. I've been that way for every space flight, and I don't think this will be an exception. Do you two talk about it? I mean, you're the rookie. He's the veteran. Do you go to him and try to talk to him about the emotional side as well as the technical side? No, oh, actually, John and I don't spend very much time worrying about the emotional side. We mainly worry about what it is and what our jobs are, and if something goes wrong, what we're supposed to do to handle it. John, what do you think will surprise him most about being in space? Well, I hope nothing surprises him, because <laughs> if it surprised him, it'll surprise me. Uh... <laughs> Live television coverage of tomorrow's launch begins on Channel 4 at 6 a.m. The passengers and crew of Eastern Airlines Flight Number 60 are all breathing a sigh of relief. Last night, their 727 aircraft made an emergency belly landing at Kennedy Airport, narrowly averting what could have been a major disaster. Now, police, fire, and emergency crews all raced to runway 22B after the plane's captain radioed for help, saying the plane's landing gear had failed. 
Before foam could be sprayed on the runway, the plane landed, sliding several thousand feet down on its belly. All 72 people aboard. Tomorrow, except maybe the weather. Well, our own weather expert, Frank Field, has more on that story from Cape Canaveral. He also has the Navy standing by to kind of dress up this live remote from down there. Jack, and you can join me if I, if I don't answer all the questions. With me is Al Nagy. He's of NASA, and of course, with 3,000 reporters descending upon this base, it's kind of tough. Al, what's the very latest that we have on the launch for tomorrow? We're at 11 T minus, 11 hours and 10 minutes and counting. We resumed the count at 20 minutes after 4, and so far things are looking very good. Uh, what can we look forward to over the next few hours into the morning hours? We'll be activating the fuel cells on the orbiter uh, right about now. And then a, uh, some backup astronauts will go into the flight deck of the orbiter and start doing the, um, uh, the flight checklist on all those switches. We leave that to the astronauts to do. And after that, uh, we'll be filling that huge water tank that can be seen out there on the pad, about 300,000 gallons worth, uh, that's used for suppressing the sound and vibration, actually. I understand that sound gets up to 168 decibels, which is enormous. It's greater than the Saturn. Uh, probably so, but that's theory right now. We won't know until we can measure an actual one because we've never set all this stuff off before at the same time. Okay, Al, thank you. So as far as we know, all systems are go. Everything is moving along nicely. The weather, as we pointed out earlier, and you mentioned, Jack, is quite important. And we have with us uh, Frank Forrester. He's with the Air Force. Frank, uh, in order to keep up with all this weather information, you have uh, around the base all kinds of towers, do you not? Is we have lightning detection systems uh, both here on Cape on the Kennedy Space Center and other locations in the local area. We use uh, two satellites, two weather satellites. One is the one that's on the local TV, and another one is a low altitude weather that gives us much more detailed weather information. We also use uh, weather radar, weather balloons, weather rockets. Uh, fairly elaborate system. And that gives us a pretty good idea, and everything, as far as the weather is concerned, is improving at this point. Right. I've got the 430 forecast, and everything looks good as of 430 this afternoon. Okay. Thank you, Frank. So everything and weather is go, everything mechanically is go, and you remember our old friend Brian O'Leary, who was with us, too. Brian, uh, here's a guy that wants to be up there, I guess, and uh, you can't do it. Well, I think someday I will be up there. I think someday many of us will be up there. You know, the millions of people that are reading magazines like Omni and Quest and so forth, I think are going to turn into tens of millions of people when they see this historic event tomorrow. Okay, Jack, that's it. Uh, all systems are go. The weather is cooperating. We expect a little ground fog around tomorrow, but the Captain Al Duff assures us that that will dissipate rapidly during the morning hours. The winds are lightening up. There's a cold front north of us, which won't affect us. So the weather is good. There's always the mysterious ponderables, but uh, we hope they don't show up in the form of gremlins to bother us tomorrow. Back to you, Jack and Sue. Frank, you've covered a lot of these space shots over the years, both for the local station here and for NBC News. How do you feel as you stand here 14 hours away from this one? Is the old spark, the excitement still there, or have you gotten blasé because you've seen so many? I think I think most folks have gotten blasé. I think it's suddenly come on, and but as you get into it, you begin to look at the fact that this is the first unmanned, or rather manned space shuttle, and this has never been tested before, that for the first time, two astronauts, two live American astronauts will mount the space shuttle and the rockets will go off, and man has never gone into space on solid rockets the way they will. All these little fears come up, all these little, uh, uh, you, you do get a queasy feeling about it. Uh, I, I just hope everything goes off, and I'm, I'm sure it will. All right, well, Doctor, we'll be checking back in with you, of course. He'll be down there tomorrow for the launch. Thank you for the fine report. Okay, Frank. President Reagan's fever was gone today, and doctors discontinued one of the antibiotics he's been taking. They say he will almost certainly be, di be discharged this weekend. Critical. It may well determine the future role that the U.S. takes in space. After all, it's a program that is already $3 billion over budget and more than two years behind schedule. What will happen next? When the space shuttle Columbia lifts off from Launch Pad 39, it will carry with it more than a $10 billion price tag. It will bear the watchful eyes of a world anxious about America's plans for the future. Engineers will be watching the performance of the most powerful rocket engines ever built. And the Pentagon will be especially concerned about the outcome. We realized back in the late 60s when we were in the Apollo program that to continue with the achievements that we would like to achieve and to utilize space like we would like to do, that we had to find a more economical way to do it. Consequently, the advent of the space transportation system of the space shuttle. At the age of 43, Crippen will be making his first ride in space. Up to now, he has been on ground support for the Skylab mission 
and a joint venture with the Soviet Union in 1975. Crippen's partner in the Columbia will be a veteran, 50-year-old Commander John Young. He has flown in the Gemini and Apollo programs. Together, they will spend 54 and a half hours in space, leaving the launch pad with rocket power equal to 23 Hoover dams. While the Reagan administration proposes big cuts in other parts of the space program, it is committed to the shuttle. Space officials say that in the future, more than half of the shuttle's functions could be devoted to the military. Pentagon planners are working on anti-satellite weapons, including powerful laser beams, while the Soviet Union is designing its own armaments for outer space. The United States will probably be denied uh, access to more regions of the world. And uh, this means that, uh, that in order to continue to have global communications and, and a global information system and the kind of things we have now, we probably will have to rely more on space systems in the future rather than less. The Columbia space shot may tell us a lot about our military future, assuming all systems work well. But things have not always worked well in preparation for this moment. 200 feet. 50 feet. 30. A test landing at Edwards Air Force Base. Manual systems fail. A computer must be called into play. Another landing test, and the tiles coating the exterior break off. They are supposed to be protection against extremes in temperature. When the tiles came loose, they set back the launch for months. In 1979, faulty wiring caused a fire inside a rocket engine. And then, just a month ago, Five members of a ground crew walked into a chamber without oxygen. They were overcome by nitrogen. Two of them are dead. These signs are ominous. Unlike earlier spacecrafts, the shuttle has never been orbited in an unmanned flight. The test of those risks is scheduled for early tomorrow morning. It will be launch before breakfast. For Channel 7 Eyewitness News, I'm Roger Grimsby. Twelve hours more to go, and you can watch the liftoff of the space shuttle tomorrow morning here on Channel 7. ABC News will have live coverage beginning at 6 a.m. Launch is scheduled, as I say, for 6.50 a.m. Go into orbit, as the Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin did one month before. Throughout the rest of the 60s, almost everybody had space fever. And that fever reached its highest degree July 20th, 1969, the day Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. Uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man. There were more moon landings, but eventually NASA turned away from the moon. By the mid-70s, space competition between the U.S. and Russia had softened considerably. Both countries realized each could benefit from cooperative space ventures. In 1975, uh, the first joint space mission, an Apollo spacecraft piloted by three U.S. astronauts docked with a Soyuz craft manned by two Russian cosmonauts. Now we are about to enter the era of the space shuttle. An era that not only looks towards space colonization and deeper exploration, but offers opportunities to improve the quality of life on Earth within the near future. And Frank Field will be at Cape Canaveral for tomorrow's launching of the space shuttle. We will have a complete report tomorrow night on News 4 New York beginning at 5. In other news, you know, there was an old aviator's adage that says any landing you can walk away from. From Manhattan school youngsters in particular, the long-awaited launch takes on a very special dimension. Science editor Earl Ubell, who's covered everything in space, including Alan Shepard's first Mercury flight, has a story on this. Tomorrow's launch could be the Kitty Hawk of the space age. A successful shuttle could open space for everybody. Perhaps not for me, but certainly for my grandchildren. And today I joined a special science class for whom that shuttle is as real as their school desks. Those children know about the 82-ton Columbia sitting on Pad 39 at Cape Canaveral. It's two gigantic booster rockets looking like space skis. It's 15-story fuel tank aimed at the sky. It's two astronauts, John Young, veteran of five space shots, and Robert Crippen, a novice, were ready. Bob and I are about all ready to fly this thing. The rockets will carry them 173 miles into orbit then drop the booster rockets and fuel tank on the way. And most important, the cargo bay, capable of carrying 33 tons of scientific and military equipment. Its doors open the universe
for telescopes and launches of satellites. And it's that cargo bay that the students of PS 187 have their eyes on. What does that tell us then? What is one of the things we're going to be interested then in zero gravity, Kirsten? This school district put a $500 down payment to reserve five cubic feet of space on a future shuttle. They are going to grow fruit flies in space. What they're going to be testing for in zero gravity is whether or not the fly knows which way to go up. Since there's no up Since and out of space. Since there's no gravity, they won't know which way to fly. The fruit flies and movie cameras to record what the flies do will go into a canister. NASA charges $10,000 to carry the experiments. The size of that canister is no bigger than this garbage can, five cubic feet. We're going to observe them in space. We're going to see how they live because this is going to be the first. Columbia will go around the Earth 36 times, up in the airless sky for 54 and a half hours. Then it will coast through the air back to Earth, glowing with the heat of reentry, then landing like a glider at Edwards Air Force Base in California. That shuttle could carry not only the children's experiments, but military equipment, satellite killers, for example. The children know that. Their priority number is number 239, so they don't get on the shuttle until 1985. And if the military takes over the shuttle, they'll have no fruit flies in space. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to join those children at 6.30 at PS 187 to watch Columbia sail into the skies. Jim? Earl, you watched the first Mercury flight with Alan Shepard. Do you recall your feelings then as compared to your feelings you'll have tomorrow for the space shuttle? Well, I, it's hard to say. Yes. You know, there have been a lot since yes, then. There's been uh, all the Gemini flights, the all Apollo. the Apollo flights, stepping on the moon. But tomorrow's different because what's going to go up tomorrow is a ship that can carry <coughs> very large amounts of equipment. And that means a whole new way of looking at space. It's also more dangerous because it's never been tested. Well, they've landed it, but yes. it's never been tested on reentry. That's true. Okay, and now on matters a bit more down to earth. The idea came from a team... Hey, at seven. This is NBC Nightly News. With John Chancellor at the Kennedy Space Center, Roger Mudd in New York, and tonight's special segment, The Long Road to the Space Shuttle. Good evening. The weather is perfect. The spaceship is ready. The astronauts are asleep. The officials here are happy, and it looks as though the space shuttle will take off tomorrow. The countdown is proceeding smoothly, and the shuttle Columbia, the most complex vehicle of any kind ever built, seems to have put behind it the troubles which have plagued this project. The astronauts, John W. Young and Robert L. Crippen, did some flying today. In a specially equipped executive jet, they flew over the Kennedy Space Center, familiarizing themselves with the runway. If there is trouble immediately after tomorrow's scheduled launch, the astronauts will have to turn the shuttle around and land here, a dangerous business. Today, just in case, they practice. As the flight directors continued the countdown and launch control, the people in charge of things here were a confident bunch today. The whole launch team feels uh, real good about the uh, operation where we stand now, and I share uh, Mr. Yardley's opinion. I think we're going to make it tomorrow, too. The crew's health is excellent, and they couldn't be more ready for the flight. Weather tomorrow should be very much like today, excellent for STS-1. There is a possibility of some low fog early in the morning. It should dissipate right after scheduled launch time. It should be so low that it is not to interfere with the uh, scheduled mission time. Perhaps a million people will be in this vicinity tomorrow here at Cape Canaveral for the launch of the space shuttle. If all goes well, there is no sign that it won't. It will be a piece of important history, a reusable spaceship, the beginning of an age in which trips into the vacuum of space will be routine. Our science correspondent, Robert Bissell, is here at the Cape, and he has this report on the mission. The shuttle itself is about the size of a DC-9 jet and weighs four and a half million pounds. But as you can see here on the launch pad, it's attached to a huge tank for liquid fuel and two solid fuel booster rockets. This will be the first time astronauts will ride into space in a craft which has not had an unmanned test. The shuttle will shoot up from its launching pad much faster than the spaceship used on previous manned missions. Two minutes and 12 seconds after the launch, 28 miles above the Earth, the two solid fuel booster rockets will be jettisoned. 
The rockets will parachute into the ocean off Florida, where NASA hopes to retrieve them. Even though the launch is fast, the shuttle will take longer to get into orbit than previous spaceships. The reason is that eight and a half minutes after the launch, the spacecraft flying upside down in a gravity-free environment will let go of its huge external tank, which contain liquid fuel, before it goes into orbit. NASA officials hope that this maneuver will permit them to predict where pieces of the tank will fall, so they can avoid a repetition of the return of Skylab. With Skylab, they didn't know where the pieces would fall. The hope is that the tank fragments will fall in this area off the Indian Ocean. Next, the two small rockets at the rear of the craft, called the Orbital Maneuvering System, will be fired to push the vehicle into orbit. Here is the path of the craft on the first trip around the Earth. As soon as it gets into orbit, the astronauts will open the huge doors covering the cargo bay. On future missions, the cargo bay will carry scientific experiments or satellites for launching. But this trip, there is only a small package of instruments to measure the ship's performance in flight. When the doors are open, we should get our first TV pictures from the shuttle, shots of the Earth. Tomorrow afternoon and evening, we'll get two more TV shows, pictures of the astronauts on the flight deck and in the crew quarters. On the second day, the astronauts will continue checking the instruments, which measure the shuttle's performance. On the morning of the third day, the astronauts will flip the craft around, then fire the two maneuvering rockets. This will slow the shuttle down enough so that it will fall out of orbit and begin plunging toward Earth. As it re-enters the atmosphere, the orbiter will heat up to temperatures as high as 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. This heat is supposed to be absorbed by the protective tiles covering Columbia, which have been so troublesome. Then one of the most difficult parts of the mission, bringing the ship back to Earth. The craft will have no power. It will be a glider falling quickly, and the astronauts will have to maneuver it to a precise landing. There are uncertainties in the first flight of any spacecraft, and they can never be resolved until the first mission is over. John? Somebody said that up until now, the American space program has been like an airline which threw away its planes after one flight. That's what happened in the Mercury and Apollo programs when the space capsules landed in the sea. If the shuttle works, it will land on the ground again and again and again. We'll have more on the shuttle later in the program. Roger Mudd will have the rest of the news after this. Set for this maiden voyage, they are lingering doubts about the outcome of the mission and deep fears for the safety of Commander John Young and Pilot Bob Griffin. Five, four, we have a go for main engine start. This is the first time American astronauts will fly into space a vehicle that has not been fully tested. There have been successful engine tests, but there have been no unmanned flights of the shuttle. Commander John Young. I think an unmanned uh, flight of a, a manned spacecraft, uh, and I always have thought that it really wasn't necessary. And if it, if it were necessary to do such a thing on this one, it would cost uh, many dollars and slip the program many years, and I don't think we could afford to do that. There are new features at the Columbia, the latest in space technology, designed to make the shuttle functional and flexible. But their reliability is unknown. The computers, five onboard computers, will make virtually every flight decision with limited capability for the crew to take control. It has never been done this way. I think the computers are the things that enable us to do the, the mission at all, as, as complicated as this vehicle is. The bay door. These huge doors run half the length of the Columbia. They should open for the crew to work in space, but they must open to release heat built up from the electronics on board. And they must close for a safe re-entry. There could be problems. We can use this extra vehicular capability with pressure suits, and Bob Crippen will go out there and use, if he has to, use his winch to close the door. So we think we can handle that problem uh, at any time in, in orbit. The heat shield, necessary to protect the Columbia and its passengers from the 3,000 degree heat of re-entry. For the first time, this protective barrier will be formed from small tiles, over 31,000 of them. There are worries that if even a few are damaged or fall off, as has occurred in testing, there may be a zipper effect that many others would be pulled away. This could be fatal. See, the tiles are put on individually, so it's hard for me to imagine a zipper effect. What it comes down to is faith. 
faith is sometimes dependable. But this time, there is untested space technology. Faith in the human factor. People such as these launch controllers in Florida. Faith even in the elements that, until recently, had a desert runway at Edwards Air Force Base in California under flood conditions. When two workers were killed last month at a launch site accident, another cloud seemed to move over the Columbia. At a time when so many questions are being asked about the competence and quality of American technology, the success of this mission, whether we like it or not, has taken on a special symbolic importance. The importance of trying to prove that American industry and ingenuity are still preeminent. But such reassurance won't come until and unless the Columbia and its crew get off well and return to Earth safely. useful work in space with unmanned probes to Mars, Saturn, Venus, and the dark regions beyond. But also in the last six years, the Soviets have had an active program in which 43 cosmonauts have journeyed into orbit. Now the United States is about to return to manned flight, and if the shuttle works, return in a big way. There are those who are asking if this $9 billion program is worth it, however, and that's the subject of this special segment prepared by John Danson. The Apollo moon landing program was a spectacular success for NASA. As it wound down in 1972, NASA was looking for a new, highly visible manned spaceflight program to maintain its glamour image. That's the theory of Dr. John Logsdon, a George Washington University political science professor who has written extensively on the space program for the last dozen years. NASA got used to the luxury of the extra money, the public attention, the uh, importance to the general public that came with Apollo and the excitement and the challenge and wanted to do it again. Skylab came after Apollo, but basically just used leftover Apollo parts. The new vehicle chosen to succeed Apollo was a reusable space shuttle. It stands at last on the launching pad, behind schedule and over budget. It could open a new era in space travel, or it could be a huge white elephant. The space shuttle was a compromise from the beginning. NASA first wanted a fully reusable shuttle, one that would take off and land like a conventional plane. But that would be very expensive, and nobody in NASA thought Congress would buy it. So the agency settled on a cheaper design, a shuttle that takes off like a rocket, lands like a plane, and can be used again and again. Furthermore, NASA said it would cost only $5.1 billion, cheap for a new spacecraft, too cheap, as it turned out. John Yardley, NASA's manager of the space shuttle, now admits it. We did not have a national commitment uh, spurred on by the president, uh, so it was a, a tough sell. Now, in that kind of environment, uh, uh, people sharpen their pencils and perhaps over-sharpen their pencils, not necessarily knowingly. But one tends to be optimistic, and in retrospect, you'd have to say that was the case. Critics say NASA's optimism amounted to a deliberate distortion of the budget figures in an attempt to get Congress enmeshed in the program, a technique known in Washington as buying in. What NASA did, really, was to uh, tell us that the uh, cost would be less than I think they knew it would cost and that they could deliver it more quickly than they did. NASA's optimistic budget quickly began to pinch. The engines for the space shuttle were radically new. When problems developed, there was no money for extensive testing or trying alternative solutions. Testing had to be put off or stretched out. The engine program quickly fell behind schedule. Then there were the tiles made of brittle slabs of silica fiber intended to make the insulation on the shuttle reusable, which it was not on Apollo. Each tile was a different size and thickness, glued to the shuttle's thin metal skin. But no one had reckoned with what would happen when the shuttle's thin skin began flexing from aerodynamic pressure. George Jeffs, shuttle manager for Rockwell International. If you're flying on a commercial airplane, it's uh, common to look out at the wing and see the top skin all buckled. It's designed that way. You can't stand that in the orbiter. The orbiter, if you did that, you'd induce loads into the tiles that crack the tiles. It was not until Congress relented and gave NASA more money that the problems began to be solved. Now, engineers say the shuttle is ready, but it's three years behind schedule and nearly 30% over budget. Counting inflation, that's almost $10 billion. One reason Congress bought the space shuttle was that it was to be cheaper, more flexible, and versatile than the present generation of expendable rockets. But some things first envisioned for the shuttle are just not practical. It can repair some satellites, but many important ones are beyond its reach. 
Their orbit is much higher than the shuttles. Industry has been slow to book space on the shuttle, even though the microgravity of space may make possible new alloys, pharmaceuticals, and electronics crystals. Few industries seem willing to commit the money necessary to develop the processes. John Logsdon says the shuttle could turn out to be a classic mistake. It's a pretty good space truck for taking things up and down, but for doing anything once you're in orbit, say it's, it's a very inflexible and underpowered vehicle. The shuttle is the most complex space vehicle man has ever built. It is a result of nine years of compromise, negotiation, and cost overruns. Soon, we'll begin to find out if it was all worth it. John Dancing, NBC News at Kennedy Space Center. There are those who say that it is essential for the United States to maintain a program of manned space flight so as not to turn over the field to the Soviets, to use space as part of America's defenses, and to use space commercially and scientifically. And beyond that, some argue that the space program is something Americans do well. The moon landings were a triumph of organization. And that exploration of this kind is an obligation for a country like ours. Uh, this morning at 2 o'clock here at Cape Canaveral, and after a busy day's work, they were put to bed, perchance to dream, at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Tomorrow morning, they'll be up at 2, and if all goes well, off the ground at 10 minutes to 7 Eastern Time. Shuttle Commander John W. Young, Shuttle Pilot Robert L. Crippen. Roy Neal knows them both. Hey, John, after this flight, are you going to give up and stop flying? You going to leave it for those younger folk? Space flight is an old man's <laughs> <laughs> And it is a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. And uh, so's Bob. And so does uh, 80 more <laughs> people in, this, in the program, uh, in the astronaut program. The commander of the Columbia, John Young, is 50 years old. This will be his fifth space flight. That'll set a new record. NASA keeps coming back to John Young because he's their number one pilot. His teammate, Bob Crippen, is 43. He'll be going up for the first time. This is not the first time John Young has tried out a brand new spacecraft. In 1965, he and the late Gus Grissom took the first Gemini into orbit. A year later, also in a Gemini with Michael Collins, Young flew some spectacular rendezvous and docking missions with an unmanned spacecraft. Twelve years ago, at the same time Bob Crippen joined the astronaut program, Young went off to the moon in Apollo 10 the dress rehearsal for a lunar landing. And in 1972, John Young landed on the moon as the commander of Apollo 16. Even then, he was the old hand showing young Charlie Duke around in a rover on the surface, as he is now about to introduce Bob Crippen to spaceflight. Crippen's been an astronaut for 12 years, was in an Air Force space program three years before that. He's been on support crews from mission after mission, always waiting his turn to fly. For the last three years, Crippen has been teamed with Young, training for this flight as it was delayed time after time for two of those years. I've been uh, waiting to fly in space for quite a few years now, and uh, the fact that we've gotten delayed a, a year or so has just been a small percentage of that. So I, as far as my enthusiasm, it's been going up all the time. Approaching his fifth space launch, even the veteran John Young admits he's a little nervous. If you uh, climb on top of a rocket, a uh, space plane like this one, a space, space uh, ship that's as big as this one, that's uh, loaded with liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, and has two uh, large solid rocket motors alongside of it, and you aren't just a little apprehensive, uh, you don't understand the problem. Roy Neal, NBC News. That's nightly news for tonight, but later this evening, NBC News will present a special report on the space shuttle that will be at 11.30, 10.30 Central Time. Then tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock Eastern Time, we'll be on the air with the story of the launch. So for now, good night from the Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral. Tomorrow morning on Today, Tom Brokaw reports live from Cape Canaveral on the shuttle launch. Today's shuttle coverage includes updates from Mission Control in Houston and the landing site at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Thursday, The mechanical arm will allow the crew of the space shuttle to put payloads into space and retrieve objects already there. 
without having to get out of their cabin and shirt sleeve environment. This significant NASA National Research Council deal was worked out way back in 1975, with the main contract for the project going to Spa Aerospace of Toronto. This mechanical arm is capable of reaching within the cargo bay of the space shuttle, extracting a payload or a satellite within its confines and putting it uh, about 50 feet above the, the main structure of the orbiter, then releasing it. Now this $110 million uh, deal didn't only involve the mechanical arm, did it? No, in fact, the, the uh, RMS system, as we call it, consists of the mechanical arm plus cabin-mounted equipment. Now, the cabin-mounted equipment consists of a displays and controls panel, which, in essence, is a number of switches and dials and, and lights which flash, which tell the operator the state of health of the, the system, as well as uh, what its present articulation is. There are also two hand controllers, which are the methods of putting commands into the arm via the, the human operator. And of course, there is a, a uh, mini computer which allows the, the hand controllers, the displays and controls panel to talk to the arm and all of them in turn to talk to the, the big computer aboard the, the orbiter itself. With delivery of the first mechanical arm due in December and with three more on the way, Spa Aerospace is now looking at ways of adapting this invention for possible use in underwater exploration and the nuclear field. Charlie Greenwell, CJOH News. Five weeks ago, when the space shuttle Columbia finally made it into the giant vehicle assembly building, the skeptics declared it would take six months for it to get to the launch pad. NASA scheduled the move in less than six weeks. There are still skeptics, but the Columbia rolls out tomorrow. In five weeks, NASA has done most of the integrated tests it had to do with the astronauts in the cockpit. But it's the previous tests of major systems that had the critics and NASA concerned. The engines kept failing from bad welds, bad plumbing, and just plain bad engineering. The 32,000 heat tiles, giving the shuttle the ability to re-enter the atmosphere and survive to be reused, kept falling off. The facts in this case are, I do believe that the engineers overlooked in the early parts of the program the complexity of the mechanical attachment and loads on those tiles. They didn't think the other was much of a problem, and they put it off until it became a problem late in the game. That oversight cost NASA 16 months more in the hangar, learning how to attach the tiles so they stayed on. Fixing the engines and the tiles threw the shuttle two to three years behind schedule and raised costs by several billion dollars. But the setbacks have not dimmed NASA's hopes. I have a high confidence that it will work. Not only will it work, but it's going to work well. It's going to do all the things that we've uh, plan for it to do. That includes scientific experiments such as the Space Telescope and launching the Galileo probe to Jupiter in 1986 as well as vital defense missions. But these are years in the future. It'll take the shuttle Columbia weighing two and a half million pounds empty five to six hours to reach the base of launch pad 39 where I'm standing. There will begin the final checkout and testing for a March launching to see how well NASA's plans for a reusable spacecraft will work.
space plane itself nestled tightly to the huge fuel tank like a baby and its mother. The two solid fuel rockets standing guard on each side, waiting for the moment of ignition when the massive engines of the space plane will blaze with millions of pounds of thrust power and send Columbia and the two astronauts who will board through this passageway away from Earth and up into the skies. By the time the sun rose over the Cape this morning with a countdown clock holding at T-minus 12 hours, the astronauts were already up and working, getting used to their launch day wake-up time of 2 a.m. Once again, they've practiced what everyone hopes they won't have to do, abort the mission just after takeoff and return to the launch site here at the Kennedy Space Center. The dry runs with their modified jet went just fine. Throughout the area surrounding the liftoff pad, it was clear something was finally going to happen. Tourists nosed their cars and vans and wagons along the Banana River for an early choice of viewing spots. By late tonight, one said, there won't be any room on this strip of beach. Certainly not any free room. At 4.20 this afternoon, the clock started again, counting down the final hours until launch. The next critical moment will come at 10.30 tonight, when they get their weather go-ahead and start loading the liquid fuel into the external tank. Then, barring problems... I have a feeling, uh... We're going to go tomorrow. It's 16 years since John Young made his first short space flight with Gus Grissom in Gemini 3, a mission that inaugurated two-man U.S. flights back in 1965. And it was just the first of four space flights John Young has made, two Gemini and two Apollo missions, climaxing with Young commanding the Apollo 16 lunar landing flight back in 1972. Now 50 years old, Young has had the visor of his space helmet optically ground so he can see the instruments properly on this, his fifth space flight, far more than any other active U.S. astronaut. The shuttle's pilot is Bob Crippen, 43 years old. This will be his first space flight, but he's had an outstanding record of endurance and performance in simulator testing. Crippen, a Navy captain, came to NASA from the military's manned orbiting laboratory program. Both astronauts have been training for five years and thousands of hours to handle the first test flight of man's first reusable spacecraft. There have been no unmanned test flights of the billion-dollar shuttle, the first time NASA will fly a vehicle without such a precaution in the history of the space program. Why take that chance? It costs you half a... between uh, 250 and 500 million dollars to go and man this vehicle and slip the program at, at least a year. There are, however, critical questions to be answered during the first flight. Will the heat tiles withstand the shock of blast off and stay attached? Will the engines, never used in space, work as well as they have to? If all the systems work, it's a 36 orbit, 54 hour long flight. The only real test planned is opening and closing the shuttle's payload bay doors. The doors must open to cool the spacecraft and must close securely for the shuttle to survive re-entry. What will be considered a successful flight? Uh, if we can just get up and get down, even if we had to do it all in one day, that would be satisfy like 95% of the objectives of the flight. NASA's short-term goals for the first flight are of necessity limited. One of the key concerns, though, is how the shuttle will handle the rapid re-entry from orbital flight. Previous tests have only proven the shuttle can land at low speeds. NASA's long-term goal is to make spaceflight an everyday operation. It's not to explore as much as it is to exploit space for profit where possible, for security where needed. Were it not for security, there might not have been a shuttle at all. The military needs also dictated carrying a heavy payload, 65,000 pounds, into orbit for the new generation of spy satellites and future laser battle stations. And the military is already the shuttle's major customer for its first 50 flights. But there are also scientific projects carrying a telescope with the power of Mount Palomar into orbit. It's a giant leap for astronomy carrying it above the Earth's dust and haze. The Space Lab carrying several scientists up for medical and technological experiments. And in 1986, the shuttle will launch from orbit the Galileo space probe to Jupiter a probe to orbit the giant planet. Landers will penetrate the gaseous boundaries to see just what the surface may be. And the shuttle, if it works, will be the building block for future space stations.
We're approaching the 20th anniversary of both the first U.S. and Soviet manned space flights. But the shuttle is as different from those early flights as a 747 from the first Wright Brothers planes. It will be the key to the exploitation as well as exploration of space in the coming decade. It began long before sunrise.